we're going to start our talk of the biochemistry of plants by talking, of course, about photosynthesis. Now, the general makeup of photosynthesis consists of light-dependent reactions and another set called light-independent reactions. The light-dependent reactions, as they sound, are dependent on photons of energy from the sun. Okay? The light-independent reactions used to, not too long ago, be called the dark reactions. That's not necessarily true because they um, don't have to occur in the dark. They are just independent of light. They don't have to have it. So we're going to refer to them as the light-independent reactions. The light-dependent reactions are divided into two phases. Those are going to be photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. Now, you might notice it's unusual that I said 2 before 1. That's because, literally, in physiological conditions that we're going to look at, photosystem 2 occurs first. The reason that it's named photosystem 2 is out of the two photosystems, it was discovered last. Okay? Photosystem 1 was discovered first, but unfortunately for the naming system, uh, it occurs second to photosystem 2. Now, light-dependent reactions must occur in the daylight. And we're going to see that, we're going to look, hopefully, and understand that they're very dependent on energy from the sun in the form of UV photons. Photosystem 2 has what we call a reaction center. A reaction center, from the, in the context of plants, is a part of the plant, particularly in the thylakoid, which we talked about previously, that is really good at being electronically excited and also donating electrons. In photosystem 2, that particular reaction center is termed P680. In photosystem 1, that reaction center is termed P700. The P and the number indicate that they're pigments and that they absorb light of that particular wavelength. For example, P680 absorbs light at about 680 nanometers. And when these reaction centers give up electrons to an acceptor that's nearby, as we'll look at, they initiate something called the photosynthetic electron transport chain. You may have heard of electron transport chain in the context of mitochondria, and in all of biology, that is by no means the only one. There are many of them. This is one of them that we're going to call the photosynthetic electron transport chain. The light-dependent reactions ultimately are going to generate two main things that are going to be used by the light-independent reactions. Those two products are NADPH and ATP, and specifically, they will be used in something referred to as the Calvin cycle. All right, before we get into most of the biology and biochemistry, we need to understand how these things work. And to do that, we're going to look at what's called a pigment molecule. This one is called chlorophyll. This is one of the chlorophylls. This is by no means the only one. But chlorophyll is what we call a light-absorbing pigment. Now, if you took biochemistry 1, you probably did a study of a molecule referred to as heme. Heme is derived from a, a molecule, actually directly, called protoporphyrin 9. This is made in plants and mammals, and it turns out that protoporphyrin 9 has two main pathways it can go. It can either go towards heme synthesis, which is done in plants, or it can go towards chlorophyll synthesis, a much more drawn-out pathway from that point. But still, Heme is derived from the same molecule as chlorophyll, and you can see it, hopefully, in the ring structure there, that macrocyclic structure. But one difference you should notice is the following. In heme, the ion in the center of the ring is iron 2 plus. In the case of all chlorophylls, it's magnesium. It turns out that magnesium is going to allow the chlorophyll to have some special properties, particularly drastically going up in energy and then also donating electrons. It's very important that that magnesium be the ion there and not the iron. One of those properties specifically is what we're going to be referring to as resonance energy transfer. Now what is resonance energy transfer? To do this we need to look at this diagram here, which if you've taken any kind of analytical chemistry, this is called a Jablonski diagram. What it shows are various electronic states from low energy at the bottom to high energy at the top and any kind of electronic energy dissipation that we have. You see on the far right we have phosphorescence, then we have fluorescence, absorption, right? Things that you've probably heard of, okay? 
You may have seen some of these quantum mechanical phenomenons before, but not maybe in the context of biology or biochemistry. Now, there's a process I want to talk about, and you can see it right here. Internal conversion. Now, knowing exactly what it is is really not important. Don't worry about the S2 over there and the S1. I don't really care about that. In fact, you don't really need to understand much of that. What you should notice is we start out here at the bottom in some sort of ground state. UV light, particularly from the sun, strikes these light-absorbing pigments such as this. And that causes electrons to go up in energy. You see electrons can be up in energy up here. Now, what is internal conversion? I'm just going to read off of here, even though you know I hate reading off of PowerPoints. Internal conversion is a conversion between electronic energy states in which energy is transferred between a donor and acceptor in vibrational resonance. That's a fancy way of saying that it's a transfer of energy between two different electronic energy states that are really close in energy. All right? Hopefully you see that this blue line that goes completely horizontally from left to right, which represents internal conversion, you're getting a switch or a conversion between electronic energy states. All right? In other words, the electron can switch, apparently, from S2 to S1. We don't really care about that so much. All right? Now, generally, internal conversion is used to describe conversion within one molecule. However, if we talk about it with respect to transfer between two molecules that are different, we call it resonance energy transfer. All right? Here I see an electron that's in an excited state up here, designated by the asterisk. It turns out that if I put another molecule over here, aka the acceptor molecule, whereas this is the donor, it turns out that for this, for this energy state, for this electron, there's another energy state in this molecule that's equal to this energy state. It's equal in energy. It's in what we call vibrational resonance. And it turns out that this electron is in exactly the same energy state as this state over here. Now, very important point. We are not talking about electron transfer. There are things that transfer electrons later in photosynthesis. We're talking about energy transfer, not electron transfer, which is kind of an unusual concept here. All right. It turns out that this electron, once it gets excited, can all of a sudden relax down to the ground state in this blue line right here. Just all of a sudden relax back down. However, it doesn't just relax back down and do nothing. It actually dissipates that energy. But where does that energy go? Well, it turns out the energy is transferred to the, an acceptor over here. And when that energy is transferred, not the electron, when this electron relaxes down to this energy state, down here at the ground state, the dissipated energy causes an electron over here to go up in energy. OK? In other words, what we have is a sequential process of light striking a molecule, a pigment that is, an electron goes up in energy, and then it relaxes back down. But in doing so, when it relaxes, it dissipates and releases a lot of energy. And it just so happens there are nearby other pigments that can accept that energy, and though their electrons go up in energy. And then those electrons are going to relax and release some energy that's going to cause another nearby molecule to have an electron that goes up. This is what we call resonance energy transfer, okay? Electron goes up in energy, relaxes back down. This concept is resonance energy transfer, all right? This is not electron transfer. These are not redox reactions that we're going to see later. Initially, in photosynthesis, as we talked about before, we have, first of all, energy transfer and then electron transfer later. So the basic idea, once again, you have light that strikes an electron in one of the pigments. Electron goes up in energy, but it relaxes back down. Okay? 
And when it relaxes down, it releases energy that activates an electron of another nearby pigment. And you see an electron go up here, and then that one's going to relax down, release energy, and excite another electron. So you're going to have a continuous process from pigment to pigment of electron excitation, electron relaxation, and excitation of the next electron. And then that one's going to relax. So it's excite, relax, excite, relax, excite, relax. But it propagates energy transfer from one pigment to the next. That's a really important concept. Okay. Oftentimes, this energy transfer is referred to as exciton transfer. Okay. Just a piece of terminology.